And at this moment, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Jackie Patterson, and to uh, give you a little more background on uh, Jackie Patterson before she speaks. Uh, she is the director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Jackie has also served as a coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. And Jackie has also worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and of course, environmental and climate justice. Uh, for instance, in her prior uh, work experiences, she served as a senior women's rights policy analyst for Action Aid, and has also served as an outreach project associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, as well as a research coordinator for Johns Hopkins University. Jackie holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in public health from John Hopkins University. And at this point, Jackie, please take it away. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Um, so I was, okay, good. So uh, thank you all, all. I'm looking forward to having this uh, brief conversation with you and kind of giving a bit of an overview of what we experience as it relates to the, to the equity issues related to climate. And I'm going to share my screen. So just briefly in terms of the historical context of, 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 of kind of the inequities as it relates to climate change, both in the climate change continuum from drivers to impacts. So we always really start in, in, in terms of as, as an African American organization based on uh, focused on racial justice issues, uh, we we tend to, to start with the experience of, of Africans in America, but before even this, um, we 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 always acknowledge that that the history of extraction, exploitation, and domination precedes our arriving on this land, and and really starts with how the or the uh, nation or the, uh, how the United States of America was colonized in the first place, and really the extraction, exploitation, and theft that, that, that formed the foundation of, of this land. And then, uh, and then, then when um, the transatlantic slave trade really began with that, with, with, in terms of African Americans and the dehumanization, the commoditization of, of human life, um, really uh, still has vestiges today, both in terms of all of the all of the inequities, but also just the continued need to uh, to assert humanity in terms of Black Lives Matter and and the, and the fight for human rights. And so we see how this this these practices of extraction, exploitation, domination are institutionalized in our policies, whether it's our trade or manufacturing policies, our labor policies, and the lack thereof of policies that uphold human rights and, and earth rights, but yet still kind of concentrate wealth and power in the hands of, of a few and in the hands of, um, of corporate entities. A quote from Martin Luther King, I never intend to adjust myself to economic t conditions that will take necessity these from the many to give luxuries to the few. And that's really the very foundation of our economic and political system. And so we talk about the dry, systemic drivers of disparity. Some of the, the core underpinnings include racism, xenophobia, as well as classism. And the instruments are corporatocracy, a primalization of poverty, and insufficient regulatory system and so forth and so on. And so we find these various populations at greatest risk in terms of the, uh, the inequities in our in our society. And we're going to make sure you get this as well so that uh, you don't have to kind of take notes while I'm running through these at the speed of light. <laughs> so um, as we as we kind of break this down, we put up we put out a few reports where we started to analyze these impacts um, and dynamics one cold blooded putting profits before people where we talk about everything from 76,000 coal miners who have died of black lung disease since 1968, while the National Mining Association, which consists of their very employers have fought against the rules that would have protected them from gold coal mine dust. The ways we have families like this Navajo family in the Four Corners region, where that coal fire power plant behind them is one of four coal fire Navajo lands and they have two coolers on their porch because they 
like 77, 70% of the people on the Navajo lands don't actually have access to the very electricity that those four coal-fired power plants that are causing harm to their health and well-being um, are ge is generating because it's going to power places like Phoenix while they don't even have access to that, but yet they, they do have the, uh, the, the chronic pulmonary, obstructive pulmonary disease, the asthma, the, the risk to the woman on the left who's pregnant, and um, who they can, they're concerned about mercury, endocrine disruptor, and other toxins and what they might be doing for her unborn babe, the, the children with asthma, as I said, the person who, who, whose picture they're holding who, who passed away from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And unfortunately, this is just one family that's symbolic of what's going on, that's, that's emblematic of what's going on in the rest of the, of the res there. We put out this report, Fumes Across the Fence Line, where we talked about the health impacts of air pollution from oil and gas uh, facilities on African-American communities. And we, and we're, where we found that the, uh, these, these oil and gas facilities are more likely to be located in communities of color, causing the health harms um, that we face. Even as we try to turn away from, you know, the coal fired, the coal and, and other ways of generating energy, the, the the alternatives gas are um, increasing earthquakes in certain places. They're releasing methane, which is also leading, um, contributing to the greenhouse gas burdens that drive climate change. I put this picture together because it it really gives a sense of the of the the intersectional impacts of some of these drivers of climate change. When we know that that uh. The, the, this person, um, this family, the pictures up in the upper left hand, left hand corner of that bag of medicines for their grandson, Antoine, who's dependent on those medicines to be able to breathe, to get from day to day. He lives cold, two, fire, two miles away from a coal fire power plant either. So he's, he, he needs those medicines to, to be able to play like other children, to be able to go to school like other children, to be able to just survive. And so when we, put all the, this constellation of photos together because it represents the African-American children who are three to five times more likely to enter the hospital because of an asthma attack, two to three times more likely to die because of an asthma attack. 58% uh, uh, of African-Americans live within three miles of a coal-fired power plant. 60, 60, 68% of African-Americans are, um, are um, Oh, sorry, live within uh, three miles of a coal fire power plant, while 56% of the population um, lives within three miles of a coal fire power plant. And African American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $10,000 a year, according to the studies of Dr. Bob, Bob, Bob Bullard. And 71% of African Americans live in counties in violation of federal air pollution standards. So, so Antoine um, is not alone. Antoine is pictured in that photo in the upper right hand corner watching as a child plays in the water fountain. And they included that picture when they sent it to me as well because they said that he's not able to play like other kids because of his constricted airways and, and what happens when he gets too excited and he's playing and, and um, environmental toxins close up his airways. And so he, like so many children, aren't whether they're not able to go to school because of poor air quality days or they're in school and the other toxins that come out of these smokestacks are, um, are, are manganese and lead which interfere with learning. And so again, when you're not able to go to school like other kids or you're having a hard time learning when you are in school and then you're in a school that's under resourced because in, um, on average, if you're living next to a toxic facility, which the majority of us do, then your property values are 15% lower and property values are which finances our school system. So we have under-resourced kids in a resource school, kids who are having a hard time paying attention in school, kids aren't going to school like other kids. And if you're um, not on grade level by the third grade, studies show by Dr. Michelle Alexander and others that you're more likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. So for us all, all of these issues are inextricably interconnected as civil rights issues that are challenged by how we generate energy, which also contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions that drives climate change. And then on top of it all, the, the, many of the communities that are more likely to have these, 
um, challenges are also more likely to get their um, electricity turned out for, for uh, turned off for non-payment. So we put out this report, lights out in the cold, reforming utility shutoff policies as if human rights matter to really raise this challenge around um, around people who are who are losing access to the 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 necessary resource of electricity and and the, and sometimes to fatal impacts. So when we talk about the criminalization of poverty. For too many people, it's actually a death sentence to not have this access, whether they're dependent on a respirator or they're use, using candles to light their home and um, end up burning down their homes because that's also the number one driver of, uh, of house fires. Or they get their oil and gas shut off and they use a space heater to heat their homes, which is also a uh, number one um, I mean, a top um, cause of, of house fires. So, so many people are losing their lives in this way. And then on top of it, and also on that side of the climate continuum, the oil and gas facilities and the man camps that surround them are, are, are generating these predator economies that are harming, um, that, are, that are responsible for the, the sexual assault and the missing and murdered indigenous women along these lines and so forth. So on the other side of the continuum, when we talk about climate impacts, we know that whether it's the sea level rise that's, that's driving, driving displacement from coastal regions, the, the, the shifts in agricultural yields where these communities often are already not being able to access healthy and nutritious foods and shifts in agricultural yields make them even less available. So, uh, so communities are more likely to get their food out of a corner store where foods are high in sodium, high in high in preservatives, high in sugars that are not only not good for you, but that are actively bad for you and could be a death sentence when you have the various um, uh, conditions that are exacerbated by those types of diets like diabetes and high blood pressure. And we all know with COVID-19, that's even more of a, a likelihood um, because of those pre-existing conditions of, of contracting COVID-19. And we also know that disasters are also disproportionately impacting these same communities who are not able to have access to um, to uh, disaster services in the same way and tend to have poor housing stock and so forth. And then on top of it all, we have the, the, the direct racism that, uh, you know, the, all of the systemic racism is compounded by the, the, the direct uh, uh, situations of just when people are just living like other folks, sleep at, falling asleep in a common room, um, being in Starbucks, uh, patronizing an Airbnb, and being racially profiled. And we saw see the same thing even exacerbated in the context of disasters after Hurricane Katrina on the Associated Press on the same day, um, same Associated Press told the stories in two different ways, which had, uh, had negative consequences. So on one, they had white people being pictured, two residents, its way through chest deep flood waters after finding bread and soda in a grocery store. But when it's an African American male pictured, it's a young man walks through chest deep flood waters after looting a grocery store. And those kind of characterizations lead to racial profiling, which leads to criminalization. And in the case of the people on the Danziger Bridge who were just going to find relatives and food, ended up being shot and killed by the New Orleans Police Department just for trying to survive like everyone else is trying to survive after these disasters. So these are the kind of racial inequities that we're finding that intersect with climate inequities. And then when we talk about Im immigration, um, we know that U the US is 4% 4, 4 of the global population, yet 25% um, of the emissions that drive climate change. And so when people are driven out of their lands like in Central America, where the drought is making people have to migrate because they're subsistence, subsistence farmers who aren't able to actually um, farm. And so they're being driven away from their lands, but yet we're treating folks like intruders when they come. And, um, and even though we should be offering sanctuary because we know we're responsible for them leaving their homes, but instead we literally incarcerate um, children by putting them in cages when all they're trying to do is survive. We all all know certainly in San Francisco about the, the impacts of gentrification and displacement, which again are being exacerbated 
aggravated by climate change and even well-meaning climate action plans that don't actually take into account these types of um, displacement um, that, that happens. And one of the reasons why I'm so glad you're in this conversation to try to, to keep away from those types of pitfalls. So we also know the, the drivers of these inequities in terms of these moneyed interests and um, we also know the impacts on our democracy. We put out this report, Fossil Fuel Foolery, where we really named how the fossil fuel companies are, um, are driving so many of the, the decisions that are being made, whether it's in our courts or in our, um, our uh, houses of uh, our legislatures or otherwise, and you know, pushing voter suppression, um, claiming that government regulations hurt the economy. Um, of amplifying job creation while downplaying lacking safety for these um, oil and gas jobs, um, using the pandemic to even weaken environmental protections and so forth and so on. So as we talk about solutions, we center our work around the Jemez principles of bottom up organizing, being inclusive, letting people speak for themselves. And we're really around just transition a vision led unifying and place based set of principles, processes and practices. And so we, move, we use this just transition framework, moving from an extractive economy that's rooted in militarism, enclosure of wealth and power, extraction, exploitation, to a living economy that's built on principles and practices of regeneration and deep democracy. So we see communities that are there where they had this community where they had the electricity shut off of their street lights and they use solar lights for their own for their street lights. We see communities like the communities that have come together on this moniker of power without pollution, energy without injustice. We all met on Navajo lands, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, Southwest Workers Union, Eastern Michigan Environmental Action Coalition to all talk about how do we build a new energy economy that's centered around sovereignty and around access and affordability for all working with partners like Grid Alternatives, doing work with, with um, training um, formerly incarcerated persons on energy efficiency, retrofits and weatherization and, um, and clean and solar installations, doing solar installations in California at the Genesee Center for Domestic Violence Prevention and Intervention, and also training the women who were survivors of violence to put on their own solar panels. And now two years later, they're all employed in the solar industry and living in their Independently. That's the importance of intersectionality. Um, growing our own food. Um, this is Leah Penniman out in, um, in New York, who is, um, who is really um, implementing a local food, uh, so food sovereignty movement as well. And really advancing the policies, moving away from the types of policies that again, enclosed wealth uh, with wealthy white folks and in terms of whether it's farms or uh, or housing, moving away from those types of policies to the policies of today where we're doing transformational intersectional um, policy making, the Portland Clean Energy um, Fund, the Feminist Green Green New Deal, making sure that everyone, you know, the, the, the black vote that happened in Georgia, um, overturning Citizens United, and really making sure that we have an inclusive transition. This is one of the programs we have, the Seeds of Resistance and Resilience, to try to advance um, local food movements, our black labor convening on just transition to ensure that black workers are at the, at the front of defining and, and advancing a just transition. Some of the land-based work around Earth and some Earth Seed Collective co-op work around solar, making sure that we have internal investments as opposed to extractive investments in our communities and so forth and so on. Making sure that we have affordable, accessible transit, that goods movement happens in a way that we're moving towards electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles with buses or trucks or, or, tr or otherwise, so that we actually are, ha have these near roadway air pollution that is eliminated in our communities and so that we all have access to, to transit and healthy, clean transit as well. Advancing eco districts and eco villages. And um, we, we launched this initiative in 2018 called Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector to really shift the hom homogeneity that we're finding in the building sector to, so that there's more people who are 
BIPOC folks who are in the lead in the building sector and that we are actually accessing and living in the buildings, the, the places where we live, work, play, and learn are buildings that are energy efficient, that are healthy buildings, that are disaster resilient buildings and so on. So I will uh, end there because I don't want to go over time and I think I'm exactly at 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll stop. So thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, running a bit behind, so normally we would have loved to have done a question and answer session, but uh, for now, please uh, chat in the chat box, add your questions uh, and send them to Maddie, and then she will make sure that they're recorded and at a future date, we'll also work to answer them as well. And just to connect this great presentation that Jackie has made on equity affecting uh, communities across the United States, I think one of the things to highlight is Jackie's particular focus on frontline communities, uh, heavily impacted, particularly by fossil fuel power plant pollution and uh, things like Superfund sites. You know, just even think about our own local climate action plan and how local communities here are affected in the southeast, particularly in Baby Hunters Point, Tra Hill, and many other neighborhoods with low income Black, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander populations. So ranging from, of course, South of Market to the Tenderloin to the Mission District to Chinatown, there's a lot to do locally. And I would urge you in your input uh, uh, as you break up into smaller groups to think about how folks have been struggling to access the basic things like healthcare, food, economic stability, clean environments and clean energy, all systemic injustices that are occurring now, worsened, of course, by the pandemic. Uh, so at this point, I'll leave it now to Rich to describe specifically the Climate Action Plan and upcoming steps for input. 